Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and today I'm very, very honored and excited to be interviewing a very, very special space champion, Michelle Lin. Michelle Lin is a second year graduate student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology housed in the Human Systems Lab. Their research is in the space architecture, specifically aiming to understand the human experience in isolation, confined and extremed environments and how to design architecture to enable exploration. Since moving from Taiwan as a first generation immigrant at the age of nine, they have traveled to 17 countries and considers themselves very privileged for having had the opportunities to do so. They have wanted to be an astronaut since they were six and still holds the dream of achieving human spaceflight close to their heart. Michelle was a part of the bioastronautics lab at Colorado University Boulder, where they fell in love with human centered design. They have a range of project experiences spanning from utilizing VR to evaluate spacecraft habitats to prototyping wearable sensor systems for microgravity research. Michelle is grateful to have the opportunity to combine their love for design aesthetics and human factors. They aim to have a hand in designing the first habitats on Mars. I'm so excited to get into the research that Michelle is doing, as well as learn about what inspired her to get into this journey of the aerospace sector. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation of aerospace leaders. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, before we get into learning more about the exciting research you've been conducting, could you start off by sharing a little bit more about your typical day? I know usually there isn't a typical day, especially as a graduate student, but how does your day usually run? Yeah, so usually um, I have a mix of classes and research, so it'll look like usually I have a couple classes, uh, maybe one or two a day, and they're about one to two hour chunks. So. Um, I'll spend either the morning or the afternoon kind of doing some prep work and um, going to the classes. And then there are usually a lot of office hours available as well. So I'll either meet up with uh, my TA in the office hours or a homework group. So very typical like college experience, but these are graduate courses. So they're usually more discussion based. Um, we usually have to read a lot more papers and come ready to discuss them. So in that in that sense, it's very different. There are less problem sets, um, less midterms, uh, but more focused on like group projects or individual contributions. And then the, the rest of my day is really a mix of things. So there's of course my research. So that usually looks like some form of um, reading some kind of literature. So I do a lot of reading, um, either pulling papers or reading papers and then going to like find their re references and then finding those papers to read. Yeah. So there's like some part of like paper wrangling. And then the other parts could look like um, writing. So right now I'm writing a paper. So I'm writing, editing, revising, like getting people's inputs on the paper, or it can even be some hands-on work. So last semester, I had the opportunity to prototype a wearable sensor system and that would look like, you know, four to five hours at a time sitting in the electronics lab, like trying to do soldering and sewing and wiring diagrams. So it really varies day to day. And um, the rest of that time um, is sprinkled with meetings. So being a researcher, you have lots of meetings to share your ideas and to get people's input on your work. So there's meetings about research, but there's also meetings outside of that altogether. So I'm on um, a graduate, many graduate organizations. So we have meetings about that. I'm a resident advisor for the undergraduate dorms this year. So we have training and meetings for that as well. And we have to plan events for our students. So there's also some, some parts of those like social extracurricular things sprinkled in my day, which I really enjoy. Wow, you really like to keep yourself busy, but I can only imagine how um, dedicated and passionate you must be in those different topics to really just dive in and take part in so many research experiences, as well as, of course, being involved in other social activities. Um, you know, and so that kind of leads me to my next question of, you know, what 
how did you get into these research experiences and advice you would give for graduate level, uh, maybe even undergraduate PhD level students who are really looking into getting get into a certain research? How do you approach a professor of like being like their mentor, of finding opportunities outside of professor or institutions to take part in research experiences? Do you have any advice for students? Yeah, that's such a great question and something I definitely get asked a lot, especially about bioastronautics, which I think for many <laughs> is a hard field to tap into. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things. So if you're still an undergrad, I would really recommend looking at the available research in your institution and um, something like an undergraduate learning experience, which are often funded by your institution. So it's an easy way for advisors to take you on because they don't have to pay the money and you get to match with an awesome project. So most institutions I know definitely have those opportunities. They open up about either once or twice a year and they run for a semester or a year at a time. And you can apply, you can just there's a bunch of listings and you can just go in and apply. So like look for keywords of what you're interested in. And maybe before that, if you don't even know what you're interested in, just write down words that it really inspire you. Like, do you like robotics or do you really like components, like building things or coding and maybe the things that interest you and then another column for like the things you're good in and then the things that you want to learn. So when you can find intersections of all of these projects that offers a little of each one, that would be a really great fit. And don't be afraid to like get things wrong. If you're interested in so many things, but you don't know which is the perfect one, that's okay. Just pick one and start. Like you'll gain so many experiences on the way that'll tell you more about the other things that you didn't even touch. Like if you want to do structures and propulsion and bioastro, like pick structures and you're going to have to do design work and CAD and building. So you'll know like, oh, I really like the building side as, per as opposed to the design side. So then in your next opportunity, you can look for things in different categories with those similar uh, characteristics. And then if you're applying to be grad school, or you're already a grad student, there's also a lot of resources on, you know, my high, my like biggest tip is to go to like Google scholars, search in the keywords or phrases that you're interested in, in researching, and then filter by year to see who's publishing papers in like the recent three years. So then you can see what, you know, what institutions or what groups are really active in this field. Um, what kinds of things they're working on, if that's interesting, and then you can go into their in their website and apply um, that way. And I think that's a really it's a really easy, accessible way of finding out who's doing what research um, at what time. So I think those are my biggest tips for for getting into research in the institution. And then outside of the institutions, there's also great ways, but a lot less. Um, it's, it requires a lot more work from you, but unfortunately, like sometimes your institution doesn't have the, the correct resources or the topics that you want to learn. So things like Space Grant is really great. So Space Grant is a NASA Office of Education funded consortium, and they're, us they're usually in every state. And so even if your school doesn't have a Space Grant, reach out to the school that does, and you can work with them. So they have a lot of projects, a wide breadth of projects, but you can also propose your own project. And that's really cool. You can write a grant and get some people interested in the idea that you want to do, get people to pitch in on their own ideas. You can write a grant together to get money to run your own project that you're interested in. Things that you can also do, like there's a lot of online programs, like NASA offers camps and summer schools that are really great. Um, I know Caltech, MIT, Stanford all offers some sort of summer schools. So applying to summer schools can be a really accessible way. Often they're paid for. Um, so you just have to write an essay and then you can you can do that. So they're, like Caltech has the, the space challenges. NASA also hosts these big idea challenges and they're really low barrier for people to do. And those are usually bioastro related. So they'll ask you to solve a big problem. Like how do we build a home on Mars? You get a team of five to 10 people together. Anyone can do it. Like you don't, you don't have to be, you know, affiliated with anyone. You can just pull your friends together and then you can work on this. 
and it doesn't have to be super professional or anything, but getting that experience of working in a team, working towards a project is so valuable that even if you don't make it to the final submission, that's still great. If you do and they like your project, you'll be invited on site to NASA where an experts will review and, you know, the final winners will get like 10, I want to say $10,000 or something to like prototype their idea and um, keep it going. So, so many opportunities at NASA, definitely look that up. Yeah, thank you so much. I think just hearing that advice is so critical for a lot of students who are interested in their um, institutions to take part in research, but also if they're not in institutions yet or they're in high school, or maybe they are in places where those opportunities don't exist, there's a lot of outside opportunities like you were mentioning to take part in. So really that was incredibly helpful. And you've taken part in incredible research experiences. I was reading your bio and we talked all about um, space architecture to bioastronautics to microgravity impacts and just so many different amazingly cool topics and I'm curious if you had to pick one project that you've worked on which I know is very difficult but what is the most exciting research project you've worked on could you describe it in more detail yeah that's a great question I mean honestly I've been so lucky to have found so many cool projects and um, yeah, I just consider myself like very fortunate for having the right opportunities. If I had to pick one, I probably have to pick like the most recent one just because like I'm all I'm always excited about like the project that I'm working on. So um, the most recent one that I'm wrapping up the paper that I mentioned was the microgravity project. So that was where I went from like posing my own research question. Like that was my own idea did my own research. And that was really the first project that I carried to fruition, which like, is so special to me, like from ideation to prototyping, to building, to flying, to data analysis. Like I did the whole wow. thing, which is like, that was just so cool to see people do their own research. And this like was the first project that made me feel like, okay, like I can do my own research. So the idea is um, inspired by my background as a trained ballet dancer and a free diver, like I really love integrating different aspects of my life into my work. They're really important to me. So inspired by that, I wanted to think about what it means to be to have fluid movements in microgravity because you see a lot of people do microgravity flights and they're all over the place. And I was the same when I my <laughs> flight, like all over the place, flailing. But you look at astronauts and they're so graceful and just going through the space station like really peacefully. So that kind of made me wonder like what is what is the process there? Like how quickly does do you, how much time do you need microgravity to get to that level? Is it just like a perception thing? Like maybe their movements aren't that different and we're just we just know astronauts are like better and more experienced. <laughs> we think that they're more graceful. So I wanted to create a system that'll allow me to investigate this phenomenon um, of the seeming like adaptation to the microgravity environment um, over time. So I pro I designed and prototyped a, a wearable sensor system. So it's it looks like a ballet garment to pay homage to my my ballet times, and uh, there's a lot of sensors embedded inside the garment that that measures your joint kinematics and your body motion in order to assess um, whether your movements are becoming more erratic or more fluid over time. And so we, I just flew in May and we're getting the data back and processing that. So both the, the, the design process was really fun. It also allowed me to prototype and build something. Like I am, just not the best at like electronics or coding. Um, that's like a side that I don't really love, but this project really forced me to become like very familiar with microelectronics and coding and like thinking things through before you build them, which is like always a an important lesson for me to learn. And you like never learn it fully. There's always like something that goes wrong. So just being able to problem solve and feeling more confident in my skills of problem solving was really important. And then also off of obviously like getting the opportunity to fly in microgravity because of this project was like so amazing and something that I've wanted to do for so long. 
um, being a designer, like I always want to know who I'm designing for and what kind of experiences that I'm designing for. So I used to have a really hard time and would lie on the floor for hours, like thinking about what it would be like in microgravity and like how I would reach and what kind of things I would want around me. But like now I don't have to imagine. And like that was such a, an awesome opportunity. So I'm really glad that that project facilitated me to be able to do that. And I'm going to Paris because of this paper that I'm writing about the project. So like, all oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely incredible. That's really, first of all, incredibly inspiring. And, you know, congratulations for taking this project forward, because I'm also, I, I really related to some of the things you were saying about how coding or actually hands-on doing engineering, electrical engineering, it's not necessarily your strongest suit. And for me as well, I can relate with that. I was um, an interning at NASA last summer for gene lab where we did the data analysis portion of using like analyzing the data that was collected in space compared to ground control and so i was very familiar very confident with the analysis portion of an experiment and maybe the idea creation but the middle part where i have to develop to actually do something was always so tricky and challenging to even think of or imagine but i think hearing your process is really inspiring to me as someone who is going to college and really wants to have a similar kind of experience of actually building things and to know that I can learn it in the process is so uplifting and it's very very empowering so you know that, that it's just incredible how far you've really come with this project and I, so exciting I'm just so excited to see where this project will go and hopefully it'll be on a lot of people's arms when they're in microgravity in the future and I'm looking forward to it and you know a lot of students who have ideas I remember I was doing a science fair project in high school. You might be familiar with a lot of those high school projects um, in science fair Intel. And I did one similarly related to fainting um, and how it relates to when astronauts come back down from space to earth, they feel really dizzy. So I was curious, is there something about that we can control using the vagus nerve? And so I did a lot of like research around that, very basic research, nothing complicated, but I was curious, how did you take this idea you had this, you know, I want to research this into let's make it happen like where did you find the mentors the resources the funding I know that's always a piece that confuses um, a lot of undergraduate graduate PhD researchers so how would you suggest we approach that yeah that's a great idea like something I also struggled with so for this opportunity particularly like it's so unique to MIT I think because we have uh, an institution called the Space Exploration Initiative within the Media Lab that funds a lot of these opportunities. So they do microgravity flights. They also do like wow. extended isolation stays in like remote islands and in like, yeah, like, like austere conditions. And then they also do like ISS and payload opportunities. So they're really unique in the way that like they have a lot of resources and a lot of money, a lot of connections to propel your project forward, which is definitely not the case for like, I was so shocked when I came to MIT and that was the case. So in terms of like accessible opportunities that could fund your project, um, there's a couple ways. So when you go from ideation to a prototype, like I think one of the most important things was like proper research and definition of your research questions. So you want those research questions to be really robust. You want to have hypotheses that you can gather data towards, which is really important. And like a lot of people miss that in, in the research process. Like you definitely want to have a goal that you're working towards because it makes it one, a lot more robust and two, a lot more, um, like palatable to the people who may want to fund your projects. Like they really want to see that you know what you're doing. Even if it's a drawing, like a CAD, like I had this image that I pulled off of like a 2D CAD program. And then I just like drew on it with my iPad. And that was like my first, <laughs> idea and I pitched that. So yeah. even something like that, where it's like so low cost and like low barrier, if you can get people to see what you're thinking about, that makes a huge difference. Um, the other thing is knowing like who to pitch. So for example, NASA has a lot of grants. So does the NSF. Those are for like three to five year projects. Sometimes they do 10 year projects for, um, different kinds of opportunities. So 
my institution has a funding listserv where it's an email list and you get pinged when there's funding opportunities like weekly. So this can be like National Institute of Health wants to fund, you know, 50K to 10 teams to research like brain cancer. It is like all over the place. So most of it is not applicable. But if you're on the listserv and you see something that you're like, oh, this is like actually really applicable to me and you have that idea and you're ready to go with it, like you're already so so many steps ahead of everyone else applying. So Definitely. having those ideas, like just going with the flow and ideating um, so that you have something ready when the opportunity comes is yeah, super critical. And funding is not easy. I had funding from a scholarship program that I was in in undergrad that made me eligible to apply during my first year of grad school. So I got funding from them and I got funding from MIT's course as well. So that they covered like the flight, microgravity flight cost, which is really expensive. Like these opportunities are definitely not accessible to everyone, um, but they're accessible to everyone to apply. Like the way to apply is very easy. Not saying that you'll be guaranteed to get it or that the, it's not competitive, but there's always a chance and you could always apply. Yeah, that's definitely eye-opening. I think a lot of times we um, tend to forget about the really cool opportunities just with a Google search. I remember when I was researching about funding opportunities and grants just for general knowledge, there was this incredible organization, which I think you mentioned, Trish, with comes under Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and Trish offers so many grants um, and anybody could apply. Of course, it's probably incredibly competitive to get that Trish grant, but I know Trish has a lot of opportunities. You were mentioning NIH. And I think just trying to explore these opportunities that already exist for professionals and young professionals, um, it, it could help you as well. So I think finding that supportive community who can guide you and point you to the right direction, to the right contacts could make the difference in the world. So. Definitely. Yeah, it really like snowballs. So once yeah. you get one, like it's it much just... easier to apply to the other. And once people know what you're doing, like have conversations with people and ask them, like, hey, like I'm working on this project. Do you have any advice for me? Do you have people I can connect to? Like, I can't tell you like the number of times I've been at like a poster session just talking to people about my work and they come up and they're like, oh my gosh, we have similar work and we'd be really interested to partner with you or people who are like, hey, I saw this opportunity and I thought of you because we had this conversation about your research. Like just talk to people about what you want yeah. to do, seek out their input, seek out mentors who maybe are not in the exact field that you're doing, but are in a related field can offer insight. When the funding opportunity comes up, they'll think of you because you thought of them, you know? So like put your name out there, get the word out there just so you're on people's radars. Definitely. Yeah. And I know we've been talking a lot about the work you've been doing, the research you've been a part of, but I'm really curious what started or kindled your passion for aerospace. You mentioned you were a ballet dancer and you were also into diving, but I'm curious, what was the aha moment that inspired you to pursue a career in the aerospace sector? Yeah, well, I'd like to say the story because it's true, but like, I don't remember it super well, but I, I remember when I was around six or seven or so, and we went to the Field Museum in Chicago, and they had a spacesuit exhibit where they let you try on spacesuits and like play in the space station. It was like for little kids. And I tried it on, and I was like, wow, this is so fun. Like, I love playing dress up. I love like, <laughs> dressing up and like walking through these steps and like feeling like someone was counting on me to do all these things. Like, that probably applies to a lot of different fields. Like, doctors and lawyers like they all do these kind of things but I love the idea of like putting on a special suit and like performing certain tasks um as like a six-year-old <laughs> so I felt like that was like my moment um that I like to refer back to but then I kind of like forgot about it until I was applying to college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I thought that um, my main concern with college was cost. So I really wanted to go somewhere that was like very low cost or free. And ultimately I decided to go to my state school, which was the University of Colorado, um, because they offered me a full ride scholarship. And I was like, well, like the other school that I was deciding still had like a $6,000 price tag. But if I could go here and it's free, like, and my family's in state, then I think it'll be good. 
but then looking at CU, I was like, well, if I'm going to go here, I want to be the best. And the best major that they had in engineering was aerospace. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll be an aerospace engineer. Um, so then um, once I decided that I wanted to apply to CU and I wanted to apply to like, quote unquote, the best department, um, then it really like kindled my decision to like apply for aerospace. But I had also been interested in space as a kid. It just kind of like happened that way. You know, I had read books on space camp. I really like the idea of like going to camp and training and kind of like I read Percy Jackson growing up and Harry Potter, yeah. and like the idea of like going to a special place and training and focusing on like being really good at this one thing, like really inspired me. So loved reading space training, like comics as a kid. And that really, I think it was always there in my childhood. And then just the decision to go to my state school kind of solidified the path to becoming an aerospace engineer. Definitely, you know, you don't have to be an aerospace engineer to work in aerospace, um, but it did expose me to a lot of different sides of aerospace engineering that I was interested in. And ultimately, in my second year, I found this undergraduate research opportunity that was being funded by the, by the school and researched with this professor, um, Dr. Anderson at CU in the BioAstro lab because it was about VR and I was really interested in VR at the time. It wasn't even the fact that it was about BioAstro, but I had done a VR project in my freshman year for a mm -hmm. like balloon launched CubeSat payload. And I was like, well, I have VR experience and this project calls for VR. And like, I had no idea what I was gonna do, but I was like, oh, it's VR, it's cool. I don't even think it was my first choice, but I, that was like the one I ended up going with. Um, and it worked out great. I was exposed suddenly to this whole other field of like human factors and um, mm -hmm. bioastronautics, which I had no insight into. Got to go to my first conference, like helping with the poster. So we all went to this conference together in Houston. It was the NASA Human Research Program conference. And NASA has these yearly and they talk about the human research roadmap and from that like in my lab I just thought people worked on habitat design because that's what we did but then going to that I'm like oh my gosh like people work on all kinds of things they talked about the twin study they work on genomics in space or like teaming and psychology and how teams perform with one another individual conflicts and I was like wow like there's so many aspects to humans in space that I had no idea about so then just kind of like I dove deeper into that because it was really important to me to like be human focused I love working with people I think that's really important I think that's why space is so important it's because it serves as gateways for us to work with each other and um, that to me was like a focus I really wanted in my life so working with people was extremely important. Working for people was extremely important. And this is like one of the sectors in aerospace, one of the few that really allows you to do that. And I wanted to use some of my other skills that kind of had been lost to me over college that I really liked as a child, like creativity and empathy and um, like the freedom to like go in the direction that you're thinking, freedom to be um, untraditional. And so, those were values that are that I did rediscovered through being in this field that I really liked. And working in this field makes me feel like I get to put the best parts of myself forward, which is why I love it so much. Wow, it's incredible to hear how, you know, a lot of students do say they were inspired by space as a young kid and it usually disappears from their life and it comes back at a later stage. And what, you know, the nonprofit I founded focuses on is bringing the space into students' lives in a more prominent manner in elementary, middle school, and high school because a lot of times it's forgotten or it's one day of learning about the moon phases and then bye bye no more space so uh, it's about trying to keep space consistently in student eyes and talk about these career opportunities so it can be in their mind um, at a younger age and knowing that you don't have to force yourself to just be an engineer or a scientist but there's a lot more opportunities and i think getting that at a young age could make the world of a difference so definitely i think hearing your story and how you were able to kindle your passion and you were mentioning dr anderson and what's funny is my middle school teacher who inspired me to get into rocketry and aerospace is mr anderson so 
just a funny coincidence there. Um, yeah, so it was wonderful hearing about your story. And my last and final question for you, now that we're able to learn about your journey, as well as the exciting research you've been doing, is what final piece of advice do you have for students regarding their pursuit of a passion in STEM, aerospace, really just any career, something you wish you knew when you were going to high school or college, um, just a piece of advice you knew a few years ago? Yeah, that's such a such a great question. Um, everything is 2020 in hindsight, right? So I giving advice is hard because um not you're not ready to hear it like at that stage. And when you ask people who are older than you, like what would you have wished you would have known? People told me all the time, but I just like in that stage in your life, it's very hard to hear it. And the best advice is learned. Like you're not going to take advice that someone gives you just because you're going to learn that for yourself. And then eventually you're going to want to give that advice to the younger people and they're not going to follow it. And that's going to be okay. (laughs) Um, But if you did follow any advice, um, I would say like stay true to yourself because it's so hard to be pressured into a certain way. And I still struggle with this. Like in aerospace, particularly, it's very challenging to be taken seriously when you're on the bioastro side versus more traditional engineering, like structures or thermodynamics, because that's really like traditional bread and butter of aerospace engineering. And people tend to feel that those disciplines are more technical, more well respected, more difficult. So, um, it's really easy to be swayed by the need to like be respected in the industry and which is like super valid, right? Like I struggle with that all the time. I'm like, do I want to switch to structures engineering? Because like, it's so hard to be sometimes in a certain field. It's okay to not know what you want or like why you're doing the thing you're doing. Um, I also question like why I'm doing this. Is it because I really love it or because I think it sounds glamorous or because I think it's cool. Like, that's okay. Like no matter your reason, as long as you're enjoying yourself while it's happening, that's fine. Um, A lot of people get scared about grad school because they see it as a five-year commitment. I think I don't because I've never seen it that way. I've always thought it as a, a place where I can go to do things that I like and I'm reevaluating year to year. And I'm only doing this because I have the privilege of not caring about the degree. Like I don't, need the PhD and that's not something that's important to me personally like the the degree Um, what's important to me is like having a great time wherever I'm at and it just happens so that the grads the grad school experience is where I'm happiest right now and I've been back to industry through the summer and I'm like oh thank god I'm here and it's great to (laughs) you know like when don't pressure yourself into doing something because you think that's what you're supposed to be doing or that's of course what's gonna like give you a better future it's so unpredictable and we've seen with COVID with everything that's happened in the world you can't predict the future so to do something that you don't really 100% love right now for your future self because you think that that's my that may be what you want is too risky for me personally. And I would not advise, um, for doing that. Um, Yeah. Finally, just be flexible in your choices, which I is so hard. Um, but like, I think being open-minded into gaining opportunities that might not be directly on the path that you want to go to can be really valuable and that I think that's the hardest piece of advice because it's so easily said and yeah. very difficult to follow. But there are times where I've been, you know, in like a policy situation or had experience with customer communication or event planning that has come back and like been a valuable skill set. So I say this to encourage you to follow different passions and different pursuits that will give you different skill sets because everyone in your industry is going to be an expert in your industry, right? Like everyone I'm surrounded by is an expert in bioastro and so am I. And that doesn't differentiate me. What distinguishes me is all the other things I do. So like put the time into doing all the other things because that's what makes you unique. That's what makes you happy. That's what makes like this everything kind of worth it. 
I will definitely take every single advice piece of advice you said to heart or at least keep it in my mind because especially what you were saying about staying true to yourself and making sure you know that you belong in a certain situation is so important a lot of times we question ourselves like you were mentioning so I think def definitely just those words of stay true to yourself and believe in yourself is so critical I think it really embodies what you were really trying to say to every student and I know I will keep it in my heart and hopefully I won't have to face a lesson but rather Rather can take what you said too hard but I, you know that that's definitely very very important to remember so thank you so much for sharing that um i, I think it's a lot of times we listen I, I remember i was reading your bio at the beginning and also reading about you on linkedin and i was like wow she's so accomplished and i'm sure she's like perfect at everything and she's like straight up to everything so i think definitely hearing your journey gave me a sense of confidence a sense of uplifting um you know knowing that there are students who are a few years older than me doing such incredible things um because it gives me the confidence to also pursue my own passions so thank you so much michelle for sharing your journey today as well as sharing a little bit more about your research experiences as well as advice i, I had a great time speaking with you and i'm looking forward to hopefully seeing a virtual streaming of iac so i can see your poster presentation and I'll definitely keep following your journey. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.